Dr. Karen Babb, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your office in Arizona. You are a biological anthropologist and associate professor in the Department of Anatomy at Midwestern University, Arizona, and your main interests are the extinct relatives of humans and what the shape of hominin brains can tell us. You've also led a series of studies on the famous hobbits of Flores Island, Indonesia, which is what we are going to be discussing today. So, Karen, I see that you're in your office, does that mean that uh, after weeks at home on lockdown, you're finally back on campus at least part of the time? I am back on campus part of the time. So I'm here in my office maybe about half the days currently and then working from home the other half. So there are some real advantages to being back in my office, but it's not full time quite yet. Well, before we get into the fascinating world of the creatures nicknamed hobbits, let's just hear a bit about your background. Did you always have an interest in uh, extinct human ancestors? Uh, not always. Uh, I would say that my interest really began as an undergraduate, uh, so in college. I took a couple of, you know, basic introductory courses, and I was... I guess um, surprised to discover that there were fossils of things other than dinosaurs. I mean, it should have been mm -hmm. obvious, but somehow I fell into that, um, you know, that easy misconception. And so when I realized there was a whole kind of world out there of, uh, you, know, you know, an amazing fossil record for humans, mm -hmm. that was just absolutely fascinating to me. And the fact that there were people actually making a living studying that was even, you know, more of a revelation. So, yeah, as I think my interest really didn't start till I was an undergrad in college, but um, I've been kind of hooked ever since. Okay, for anybody who doesn't know, what are we actually talking about when we say the hobbits of Flores? Uh, when were they found and what was so special about them? In 2004, there was an announcement kind of in the scientific community that they had found a series of fossils in a giant cave on a very small island in Indonesia. So Indonesia, of course, is a chain of islands kind of stretching off the southeast corner of mainland Asia. And Flores is a very small island kind of along the eastern end of that island chain. And there's a really big cave called Liang Bua Cave, which as I understand it means cool cave or cold cave in the local language. And in fact, this cave had been used in the past as a big open room schoolhouse. Um, it provided shade in this very tropical environment. And they were doing excavations there really for archaeology, for human archaeology. And they found some modern human material in the upper layers of the cave. But when they dug deeper, they were surprised to discover fossils of something that was clearly not like the other humans in the cave. It was something different and more primitive. And so initially, they thought these dated to around maybe 95,000 years ago to as recent as 12,000 years ago. But since then, they've redated them to a little bit earlier in time. So maybe around 100,000 years to about 60,000 years, which actually predates the modern humans in the area. A couple of things that really stood out from that initial description were mm -hmm. that the individuals were very small, very short. So the most complete skeleton, the LB1 skeleton, um, is about maybe 110 centimeters. So that's just over a meter in height. That's kind of typical for a five or six year old um, in kind of modern human groups now. So those were adults and they were basically the height of modern day five year olds. So that was really unexpected. And it's worth pointing out that they found skeletal bones from multiple individuals and they were all small. So this wasn't a fluke, a single individual. It was typical of this population. They found only one complete skull, but they have two lower jaws and the lower jaws are both small and the one kind of face and um, the part of the skull around the brain suggest that they were also very small brained. So the brain was like the size of a chimpanzee brain, not the size of a human brain. So they were very small and they had very small brains. And those were unexpected um, discoveries 
at a fairly recent date in human evolution. I mean, 100,000 years ago, you have modern humans, fully modern humans in Africa and up into um, the Middle East. So this was um, just not what we were expecting to find at this time period. And is it true, Karen, that they had flat feet like the uh, hobbits of Tolkien, or is that just uh, <laughs> something the press came up with? Well, actually, there is something kind of interesting about the proportions of the leg and the foot. Um, it makes the proportions suggest that the feet were really long. What it was was actually the the leg is quite short, which is one of the reasons that overall they're so small in size. Their feet were not particularly small, but their leg or particularly long, but their legs were so short that they look by contrast quite uh, long. So, okay. And of course, we don't know if they're furry or not. So. <laughs> So there was quite a lot of disagreement amongst paleoanthropologists when these fossils were discovered on Flores. And although they were christened with a new species name, Homo floresiensis, there were those who weren't convinced they were even a new species at all. Isn't that right? So anyone who follows um, human evolution research on any level knows there's always disagreement. Um, it's one of the oh, things yeah. that makes it so interesting. But yes, this was quite a contentious debate, I would say. So the original description, as you said, described these as belonging to a new species, Homo floresiensis. And the Homo part of that name suggests it's in the same big group that modern humans are in, Homo sapiens, and also Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis. So in this bigger group, but not modern humans, certainly not Neanderthals, in fact, nothing we had quite seen before. Um, but there were certainly researchers who argued quite um, vociferously for a very different interpretation, that in fact, this was not a new species at all that these were modern humans, but they had either individually or as a group suffered from some kind of abnormal clinical condition. So maybe a disease. Um, so a couple of examples. Certainly the small brain really caught everyone's attention. And so um, there were a number of researchers who argued that the individual, at least with the very small brain, had some kind of disorder that included microcephaly. So microcephaly means small head, and the head is small because the brain is underdeveloped in size. And so the small brain means that the, the, the bone around it never really expands either. And so um, they were, I don't think anyone was able to ever identify a particular syndrome that included microcephaly that could explain all of the unusual traits we were seeing, but that was certainly um, an important part of that counter argument. But there were several other suggestions. So people suggested that perhaps there wasn't enough iodine in the local environment. And in the absence of iodine, the thyroid gland doesn't, um, doesn't work correctly. And so the growth hormones that come out of the thyroid gland wouldn't have been um, produced normally. And so that would explain the short stature of all these individuals. Um, several other um, kind of clinical or pathological pathologies were um, suggested, including Lerone syndrome, a kind of endocrine um, dwarfism. Down syndrome was suggested as well. And some of the reasons these were appealing is they included some element of shorter height and also smaller brains, although I will point out that in none of these cases is it typical to have an individual just over a meter in height with such a small brain. So none of these really explained all of the characteristics we were seeing. Right, so if we are talking about a new species here, that brings up a lot of questions. Not only do we have to ask what Floresiensis evolved from, but also why they were isolated on that island. You're right, it does uh, bring up a lot of really interesting and I will say not entirely resolved questions. Mm. Uh, so I would say that there was a, a kind of a period of time where there was a lot of very vigorous debate about whether it was a new species or not, like we just talked about. And I would say that most workers have moved past that particular point of contention. And mm -hmm. now the question is, where does Homo floresiensis fit in to the kind of human evolutionary tree? So even with the initial description, there was some doubt expressed, maybe two big ideas. And I would say those are the same two 
big ideas more or less that are persisting today. So one major possibility is that Homo floresiensis represents a dwarfed version of a different species called Homo erectus. And that's actually the species that I, it's kind of my bread and butter, so to speak. That's what I've been studying um, since I did my PhD dissertation. Mm. And so that's actually where my interest in Homo floresiensis came from. So Homo erectus, we think, originated probably in Africa, possibly in Eurasia and spread into Southeast Asia, into Indonesia, although not Flores, um, rather the larger island of Java to the west. And we find it there beginning about 1.3 million years ago. And it persists in different, slightly modified forms until as recently as 100,000 years ago. So it had a very long tenure, Homo erectus, on Java. Mm. And so it was a reasonable, um, certainly a reasonable starting place to think that there was a special evolutionary relationship between Homo erectus on Java and Homo floresiensis farther east on Flores. And so the idea was that some population of Homo erectus kind of worked its way over to Flores and then got isolated there, got stuck mm. there. And something that happens to large mammals on islands sometimes, but not always, is that they become smaller in body size. Maybe there's no predators, so they don't need to be quite as big, or maybe there's a, a limited number or a limited amount of resources, natural resources, food, for example, and so that might favor having a smaller body and, and sort of uh, lower nutritional requirements, lower calorie requirements. And so this is a major idea. One major idea is that Homo floresiensis is a, was an isolated population of Homo erectus that over time became smaller. Yeah. I would say maybe the biggest stumbling block here, well, there's maybe two stumbling blocks. One is the brain is really small, like much smaller than Homo erectus, just like it's much smaller than modern humans. And so that that requires not quite special pleading, but almost. Um, we only have maybe two other examples of um, mammals who not only got smaller in their body size, but showed this kind of massive reduction in brain size. So that is certainly not typical. The second stumbling block is that there are aspects of the Homo floresiensis hominins, the fossils, that are more primitive than what we typically see in Homo erectus. So one of them we already alluded to earlier, um, and that is the limb proportions. It had very short lower limbs, but it didn't have particularly short arms. And so this kind of longer arms and shorter legs is a more primitive body configuration, something we associate with australopiths, which are much earlier um, hominins from millions of years ago in Africa. Um, certainly other aspects of the morphology like the foot and some aspects of the teeth seem quite primitive. Um, and so there are these features that seem to indicate another major idea. And that major idea is that Homo floresiensis actually evolved or descended from something, a species more primitive than Homo erectus. And so what that implies is that some species like Homo habilis, the, the handyman, the tool maker mm -hmm. um, from Africa, which is known from uh, maybe two or three million years ago, that that actually migrated out of Africa and eventually some subset of that group ended up on Flores. It wouldn't have been a direct line. It would have been a slow, gradual process of populations expanding and um, dispersing, but from, from west to east and eventually ending up on Flores. So this is another out of Africa we're talking about. Yes. And so the, the advantage of that idea is it kind of explains some of the more um, unexpectedly primitive features and the very small brain. But the challenge is there is no evidence of that migration anywhere else. Like we don't have any sites um, in South Asia. We don't have any sites even elsewhere in Flores that are that old or that have that kind of primitive morphology or anatomy. Not yet anyway. 
you never know what will be found in the next uh, yet, few decades. Course. There's always the yet, right? <laughs> I mean, that's absolutely true. I mean, we certainly have had a number of unexpected discoveries in Southeast Asia, in Eurasia in the past 30 years yeah. that have really changed our view of the role of Asia in, homo, in the evolution of our own genus. Right. Let's talk uh, a little bit about the size of these hominins. The skeletons that were found suggest that they were not much more than three foot tall. Now, that seems quite startling until you consider some of the animals on the island. Isn't that right? So there are there is at least one other type of large mammal that seems to have become smaller on Flores in particular, and that is Stegodon, a kind of... Um, ancient relative of elephants. And so there is a dwarf stegodon found on this island, suggesting that this is not an entirely unique event, even on Flores. And certainly we have examples of dwarfism of large vertebrates and mammals on many other islands. Um, there's been, like I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, there has been some debate surrounding, for example, the small brain size of um, Homo floresiensis and whether that fits with an island dwarfing model, I guess. Uh, and in part, it depends on what you think is the starting point. So if you think that the most, the youngest populations of Homo erectus on Java are the starting point, well, they have pretty big brains, and that would be a mm. really extreme reduction. Mm. If you start with something a little smaller, like maybe the, the earliest Homo erectus known outside of Africa from Eurasia, the reduction isn't quite as extreme. So there's kind of a lot of factors to think about with regard to evaluating how likely it is that this represents an island dwarfing event. Isn't it true, though, Karen, that like uh, on islands, sometimes a small animal, I, I believe there's, there's rats and um, uh, reptiles on floors, which got bigger. So things get bigger and things get smaller. Yes. And so, it, it, yes, that's correct. Some things get bigger, some things get smaller. It kind of depends on the, the um, particular... I don't know, the particular features of that species and also the environment they're in, whether they are they find themselves in greater competition, whether there's a shift in the predators that they are trying to avoid. It depends on the resources available to them. And so those diff that kind of a combination of those characteristics mm. on islands allows some species to get smaller. Some species actually get larger. And I Think, but I would have to double check. I think that the uh, there are some reptiles called Komodo dragons on the island of Flores mm. that actually got quite large um, on this particular island. And so, yeah, we see these kind of unusual um, kind of dwarfism and gigantism events happening with animals on islands when they're isolated and their kind of situation changes from the mainland. And of course, this would happen over generations, over a long period of time. Yes, and so that raises a good point, particularly with regard to the Homo floresiensis material. There are other hominin sites, so um, mostly, but not entirely, stone tools elsewhere farther east on Flores. So in this area called the Soa Basin, there's a site called Matamenge. And for a long time, there have been stone tools known from there around, starting around 800,000 years ago, actually. And since the discovery of Homo floresiensis, they have now recovered a very small amount of hominin material, I believe. And um, it doesn't, there's not a lot of it, and so there's not a lot of anatomical detail to look at, but it appears to potentially also be a little bit small in, in size, and certainly it's earlier in time, closer to 700 or 800,000 years ago. So if, and it's a big if, but if that shares a special relationship with Homo floresiensis, then this process of potential body size reduction, if we think that Homo erectus is the ancestor, that might have begun, um, you know, six or 700,000 years before we find them uh, at the, in the Liang Bua cave. And, and possibly earlier, but that's sort of the earliest evidence we have elsewhere on Flores. Well, only just last year, 2019, a discovery in the Philippines about 2,000 kilometers from Flores heralded yet another small-bodied species, Homo luzonensis. So does this find uh, shine any light on the hobbits of Flores? 
Possibly. So I think the most that we can say based on the small amount of material found in the Philippines is that Homo luzonensis indicates that island dwarfing is perhaps not so unusual for mm. our ancestors. Um, so it, I think maybe that's one thing we can kind of pull out of that. We now have two islands in Southeast Asia. We have two instances of, of likely or possible um, body size reduction on these islands. And certainly in both cases, we have some unique anatomy, unique morphology. So we might just view these islands as kind of ex evolutionary experiments where you get a population that gets isolated and kind of evolves on its own track for some period of time. Um, you know, we're certainly, we maybe want to think of human evolution as this very linear progression from primitive and small to big and more sophisticated, but this just highlights something that I think paleoanthropologists have really come around to, which is that our tree is much bushier. There's lots of little experiments and side branches that don't really lead to anything in a kind of current day, but indicate that we are a more flexible and adaptable species, or genus at least. Um, and so I think that Homo luzonensis indicates some of that kind of evolutionary potential. Uh, Karen, wasn't there an attempt not too long ago to extract some DNA from the uh, Floresiensis bones? Yes. I mean, I'm not uh, personally familiar with what was done, but my understanding is that several different teams of ancient DNA experts did attempt to extract ancient DNA from the Floresiensis remains, and they were unsuccessful. Uh, so I think part of the reason that they were unsuccessful, even though these are around the same time, the same age as some of the Neanderthal fossils from which we have successfully extracted ancient DNA, is the particular um, environment of Southeast Asia, which is very mm. tropical. It's very humid, it's very hot, and those are situations in which DNA is very prone to um, degradation to kind of breaking down. And so on one hand, it's not that surprising, although it's certainly disappointing. Uh, my understanding is that they have done some kind of parallel work. So some of the people watching this will, will know that there has been a lot of really interesting ancient DNA discoveries indicating that modern humans, as they migrated out of Africa, were interbreeding with various groups as they moved through different different geographic areas. So as we moved through kind of um, the Middle East and Europe, we picked up some Neanderthal DNA. Then we kept moving and we ended up farther east in Asia and we picked up some DNA from um, what are known as Denisovans. Um, and so we see in the DNA of modern people little snippets mm. of these ancient um, interbreeding events. And so what they did was they looked at modern day humans, just normal everyday humans, but ones mm -hmm. who've been living on Flores for a while, whose ancestors have been living on Flores for mm. a while. And they looked to see whether there is any unexpected DNA indicating an ancient interbreeding event with someone that could have been Homo floresiensis, and they didn't find any. So that may suggest that Homo floresiensis went extinct before modern humans ever entered the area. It could indicate that modern humans entered the area and did not view these hominins as um, kind of mating partners, as you, you know, you might think, or sort of members of their own group, and so there was no interbreeding. Um, those are some likely interpretations mm. of that limited evidence we have. And aren't there other things that they can try? I think uh, something like a protein analysis, I think it's called. I'm hoping, I'm hopeful. I don't know, this isn't really my area of expertise, but obviously I think those of us kind of following along um, know that there have been pretty unbelievable advances in the area of ancient DNA and what they've been able to extract, to um, replicate what they've been able to do. And, and you're correct that they've certainly started moving into other areas that aren't strictly DNA but are more like mm -hmm. the products of DNA. And they've had some success with much older fossils using that approach. Whether that would be affected by the same kind of hot, humid environment, I'm not certain, but we can kind of hold out hope, I think, that 
additional advances will potentially allow us to get a glimpse at the kind of DNA profile or a little bit more about the kind of physiology of these hominins at some point in time. And this, of course, is why we are so successful with a Neanderthal genome uh, that Svante Pabo did, um, sequencing the whole genome, is because they were found in colder climes. Yes, and those are a bit more, um, the, it's just a more favorable environment for DNA um, preservation. And so, yes, they they have, as you as you know, they have been able to get not just one genome, but multiple mm. genomes. They've looked at the mitochondrial DNA and also nuclear DNA, and not just Neanderthals, but also some early modern humans. And they've done some really interesting work with that. Um, and so we're, I guess everyone's probably still hopeful that at some point we can get a little more information about Homo floresiensis through these same mechanisms. But as of now, the technology or and or the preservation is just not there. Well, a question that people will be asking other than where the hobbits came from is, where did they go? Um, what happened to them? <laughs> it's a good question. So based on the newer dating from the cave, they seem to have gone extinct. Um, well, the last fossil evidence is about 60,000 years ago. The last stone tools seem to be about 50,000 years ago. And that is very similar in its age to when we see modern humans moving into Southeast Asia. So one possibility is that the Homo floresiensis was outcompeted by modern humans. So modern humans moved into the area and they just couldn't kind of, they couldn't coexist and went extinct. It's possible that their relationship was more um, more aggressive and potentially they were actively fighting. We don't have any evidence of that, of course. We don't really have any specific evidence of them coexisting. So a third possibility is that they went extinct on their own, unrelated to the arrival of modern humans. Um, as I mentioned, as we kind of talked about a little bit with the ancient DNA evidence, mm -hmm. a fourth possibility could have been that there was some interbreeding event and some more um, kind of interaction in that way, but there doesn't seem to be, at least right now, any evidence of that in modern human genomes from that area. So most likely they either went extinct on their own or there was some kind of negative interaction with modern humans, possibly just couldn't compete with them. Maybe their um, technology wasn't as sophisticated. Um, and so they went extinct basically around the same time that we see humans entering into this general region. And I know this is going to appear in the comments section after this, but there are going to be people who say, well, maybe they're still around. You know, there's these tales that people have of these little people, that, uh, folk, you know, folk legends and everything on Flores. Um, do you ever hear about that? I only know very vaguely that there have been these kind of stories passed down of these little people living in the forest. So it's possible, like I said, that they did coexist with modern humans for some period of time before they disappeared. I find it almost impossible to believe that they're still there somewhere. Um, but I guess you can't rule out anything, but I think it's extremely unlikely that somebody would not have um, more definitive evidence of this at this point. They wouldn't have been observed uh, in more recent times. Uh, so I, I suspect that that's not the case. Um, I guess I've been a little hopeful that maybe some of their DNA had continued on, at least in the modern human genome, the same way that Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA has. We don't see evidence of that currently. so. Although it makes me a little sad to say, I expect that they've gone extinct the same way most of the species I study have gone extinct and are completely um, absent today. Well, this is such an intriguing story and no doubt it will continue to inspire argument and speculation for years to come. Now, I will leave a link to your website, karenbab.com, in the description below. And hopefully you can come on to the show again one day in the future, perhaps talk about Homo erectus, who knows? And uh, all that's left to say is thank you very much indeed, Karen, for coming on to Evolution Soup. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. It's been a real pleasure. I really enjoy talking about my work, and I would love to come back and talk about Homo erectus sometime.